Mayor of South Bend, Indiana, our first openly gay candidate for president. There's more. Veteran, millennial, Rhodes Scholar, polyglot, concert pianist, and author of the new bestseller, Shortest Way Home, One American's, One Mayor's Challenge, and a Model for America's Future. Okay, so first of all, did I, did I get the name? That was pretty good. That was yeah. pretty good? Yeah. All right. They just call me Mayor Pete back home. I feel like it's all yeah. in the sort of how you run those last there two syllables <laughs> together. What does it mean? Uh, it, it translates as something like uh, keeper of the poultry or lord of the poultry. <laughs> um, in the Maltese language, tijij means, means hen. Um, so, uh, You're the hen king? Uh, something like that. Yeah, I guess my people were poultry. My father immigrated from Malta in the 70s. It's a common name over there. I, I wouldn't even be the... Is there a Maltese person out there? Nice! Oh. Two. That's great! We are few and far between, but we got to stick together. I wouldn't even be the first president Buttigieg. They had a president Buttigieg in Malta who's not even related. It's, it's that common of a name. Wow. Um, but uh, not so much around these parts. Well, that etymology has got to get you some votes in farm country. <laughs> um, there seems to be some boot menum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll dive back into the specifics, but uh, make your 30-second elevator pitch for why Americans could, should seriously consider a young mayor of a small city for president of the United States. Yeah, so the basic idea is that our country is going through tectonic change right now. We can't pretend that we can reverse it. All we can do is try to master it and make it work for us. That calls for a very different kind of leadership than we've had. And even though this is a non-conventional background, maybe, just maybe, we'd be better served if our uh, capital, Washington, started looking more like our best-run cities and towns instead of the other way around. And maybe a leader from a new generation is just the kind of person to bring that about. What drew you to politics? I mean, there are other ways to lead other mm -hmm. forms of service. Why not social work or journalism or teaching like your husband? Uh, so I grew up in a household that was not politically connected, but was always politically involved. And, and I came to understand how important those issues were. Um, I have a lot of admiration for, for civic volunteerism, different forms of engagement, teaching, journalism. There was a period when I thought I would be a journalist. Um, You're a pretty good live blogger, I hear. <laughs> um, I do my best. Um, but I, I think that um, I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm seeking longer impact than I would have been able to. I, I think a journalist can change the agenda in a day. I think in politics, you have to wait a lifetime, but then um, you can really, in a lifetime or a political lifetime, bring about profound changes. And then, you know, scholars, intellectuals, maybe make the most impact of all, but often they don't live to see how that impact plays out. So uh, I guess I, was, I wanted to play a longer game than if I were a journalist, but I'm not patient enough to be an intellectual. And, and so <laughs> being in politics seemed like a happy medium. <laughs> You know, you've, you've said that um, when it comes to running against Trump, that as a gay man in Indiana, you're used to dealing with bullies, which is a, is a great line. Um, but you only came out even to family in 2015. Um, was, was knowing that you wanted to run for higher office part of the impediment there? I'd, I'd just like to hear about your journey. Yeah, I think I had sort of taken on board by the time I did first run for office, and my first run was an uphill uh, effort to become state treasurer in 2010. There's a whole story to that. Um, at that point, I think I understood that you could either be out or you could be in office in Indiana. You could not be both. That was also around the time, uh, or, or a little bit after the time I joined the military. And at that time, it was a matter of law that you could either be serving or you could be out, but you could not be both. And so uh, I lived with that and to some extent was okay personally with the fact that my job dominated my life so that I didn't have to feel so much what I was missing in terms of a personal life. Um, what put me over the edge was when I was deployed. Uh, while I was mayor, I took a leave of absence to, to go to Afghanistan. And I came back realizing that I wasn't getting any younger, that you only get to live one life, um, and feeling kind of embarrassed that I was a war veteran, the mayor of a city, in a position of responsibility. Um, I was a homeowner. I was reasonably accomplished and experienced. And I had no idea what it was like to be in love. And I just thought I had to put an end to that. So it was awkward timing because I was up for re-election. 
Um, but I realized it was time to come out. And then uh, the only question was how voters would respond in my community, which was generally democratic, but also socially conservative. Right. And uh, they responded by reelecting me with 80% of the vote. So I guess they didn't care. You know, representation matters so much. Um, have you heard from anyone moved by your story to come out or otherwise face homophobia themselves? Yes, many times, and, it, and it's really meaningful every time I hear that. I mean, I came out because I just wanted to have a personal life. It wasn't about the public implications, but I knew that it would have public implications. And to the extent that it's made it a little bit easier for somebody else coming along. And it's especially moving when somebody lets me know that, um, that my story helped them to come out. Um, that's one of the times you realize that, that when you're um, not sure whether it's safe to do something, but, but it's true to yourself to do it, that there can be ripple effects of that that you'll never even know. Is, this, is there a story that particularly sticks with you along those lines? Um, you know, just the range of people who came out, um, especially people, or the range of people who got in touch, um, some from rural Indiana, weren't sure if anybody, I mean, again, you know, even I, I went to high school under the illusion that there were no gay students in my high school. It was like a thousand students there. That's statistically preposterous, but to, <laughs> to my knowledge, there were zero out students. So you really think you're the only one. You think there's something wrong with you. Yeah. And hearing from people who had had that experience, um, I heard from somebody I'd served with in the military, gone on a couple of risky uh, outside the wire trips with, who was in the exact same boat, and I never knew it, and, and got in touch to let me know. Uh, so just realizing how many people had had some kind of comparable experience was really, really striking. You know, you said that your three or so years at McKinsey was one of the most intellectually informing times of your life. What did you do and, and why was it so profound? So I learned a lot. In fact, it was the first time I got to spend quality time here in San Francisco because we, had, we had a, uh, did some client work here in renewable energy. Uh, but my, my real specialty at, at McKinsey was uh, grocery pricing. And um, believe it or not, that was really intellectually formative. It was not the kind of thing that drew me to join the firm. Uh, they kind of lured me in by talking about all of their nonprofit and public sector work. Um, but actually, what I learned was how data works. My job, we were serving a grocery company and they were trying to figure out how to cut prices and how to have an impact from that. And it turned out the only way to answer the questions the client was asking was for me to crunch this ridiculous database of, of zillions of lines of basically data about every item they ever sold and how much they charged for it. And I began to understand data structure in a way that I carried with me when I became mayor and tried to have a more data-driven government at a time when I felt like a lot of decisions were me being made by the seat of the pants. Like basically a problem was big enough to deal with if it got the attention of somebody who got the attention of a council member right. or a foreman on a city crew if it was potholes. And the problem with that is a lot of the areas of greatest need were neighborhoods where almost never did their problems get to somebody because they were so used to being underserved that they had just given up. So when I set up a 311 system, it was to keep a campaign promise that was partly about customer service, but, but it was really about getting the data that would allow us to figure out, oh, there's a really weird pattern of us failing to pick up trash on time in this particular neighborhood, we got to figure out why. And did those communities actually utilize 311? Yeah, they do now. Uh, yeah. we, we've gotten almost a million calls on that system. And, um, and, so, and you learn some things, including things with a lot of moral weight. Another example that's a little darker but very important had to do with a piece of technology we set up to uh, detect, it can acoustically detect a gunshot. Mm. And obviously very useful tactically because you can scramble police officers to the scene of a shooting before anybody's called it in. Somewhere along the line, we realized we could actually check of the, of the shootings that we hear through the system, how many times was there a 911 call? Um, and we assumed it would be about 80% of the time. Turned out it was about 20% of the time. And what I realized was that we actually had a measure now, an objective measure, of how much people thought it was worth calling 911 to begin with. And because police sometimes project an air of omniscience, it's part of the job, um, it, it, when people heard a gunshot and didn't see a police car, they didn't think 
that we didn't know. They thought we knew and we didn't care. That was the assumption they made about our attitude toward those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so being able to correct that and address that through data, through this technical thing, wound up having a lot of moral weight for how we served some of the most vulnerable residents and neighborhoods in our city. It's interesting because McKinsey has, you know, been in some big scandals lately vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia and other regimes. And, yep. and I think more broadly, there's a critique of it, sort of an analog to hedge funds, like mm -hmm. extracting value. Um, and, and I'm wondering how, how you kind of confronted that on the job when you were there, what you think of that dynamic of sort of yeah. the large global consulting firms now. You know, I think uh, it really depends a lot on the client and a lot on the engagement, but I always felt like we were contributing something real. I mean, I, not only was I working crazy hours, but I think we were helping clients solve problems. I think where the firm has mostly got into trouble recently is some bad decisions about what clients they were going to serve. Uh, and, you know, consulting is treated a little bit differently from law, and I think with good reason, right? So a law firm is often not, you don't necessarily think bad badly of a law firm because some of the clients they serve are doing bad things. I think because there's this American understanding that everybody's entitled to representation. But, you know, everybody's not entitled to management consulting. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I think a firm can and should be more selective about who it serves. Mm -hmm. um, my personal experience was, was positive. I, I liked my colleagues. I liked the work. I found it very interesting. The problem for me, though, became one of purpose. So uh, I, was, I was in, I remember a, a distinct moment when I'd been crunching numbers all day, um, and I got up to get a cup of coffee, and I, it was as close as I've had in my life to a road to Damascus moment. Uh, it wasn't anything against my colleagues or my client, it was just I got up, I took a breath, and I thought, I don't care. <laughs> Like I just didn't, it was not deeply important to me that this grocery company outsell that grocery company. And that was when I realized that client service wasn't for me. And again, that's not intended to be a knock on the people. Some people care enough because they, it's so important to them. Their professionalism is so important to them. Or maybe just the compensation. I mean, for whatever reason, you think it's worth it. Um, but for me, I realized at that moment that I was going to have to find work that was intrinsically important to care about things not just because a client was paying me to care about those things, but because they mattered to me. And was it then that you enlisted? Uh, so, it, yeah, it was around that time that, that, um, that I was commissioned. Um, that came about, I'd always, there had been a family tradition of military service. And uh, a lot of people I really admired at Oxford when I was over there had graduated from the academies. The Rhodes Scholarship almost always has people out of West Point yeah. or the Naval Academy uh, or the other academies. And so I always kind of vaguely wanted to do it, but I always had some reason not to. I'm overseas, I'm in grad school, I got a busy job, you know. Um, but there was this kind of nagging question of why aren't you wearing your country's uniform? And the thing that really put me over the top was an experience when I took a few days off from my consulting job, rounded up some friends, and we went to Iowa to knock on doors for Barack Obama mm -hmm. in 2008. And they sent us to some of the most low-income communities in South Central Iowa. And I felt time and again, I'd knock on a door, somebody would come to the door who looked like a kid to me, and I was all of 25. Um, <laughs> And this kid would, would let me know that he was on his way to basic training or headed in the military. And I thought, how is it that this community is emptying its youth into these conflicts? And I can count on one hand the number of people I knew at Harvard who served. And I began to realize that I was part of the problem, especially having been reared on that tradition at Harvard, for example, you soak up the legend of the Kennedys, right, in the military service. I mean, that's something that George H.W. Bush or JFK would have done as a matter of expectation, that you went into the military, and, and that was when they began to get to know fellow Americans. It's, it's how they wound up, you know, on an equal footing with the son of a, I don't know, a farmer from Indiana. Um, and it had this leveling effect. And that really faded away so that by the time after the Vietnam War, military service became less and less something that unified people across backgrounds, and more and more something that uh, that helped mark or accentuate those class backgrounds. And so I was not the scion of a wealthy family like the Kennedys or the Bushes, but I was somebody who had the advantage of that privileged edu education and, and realized that if I weren't as vulnerable to being called up as a lot of others, I was part of a problem. So I hear in that that you see it as a, as a symptom of income inequality, but also probably that military service 
has been and maybe still is a necessary marker for many who want to go on to high public office. Which was kind of pushing you more? Did you know even back then that you really wanted to go full force into politics? I was interested in public service by then for sure. Uh, I'm not somebody who would argue that, that you need, that it's a, a prerequisite, that you need to have served in the military to be a good public official. I do think that it helps. Uh, I think that it's a, an example of where you commit yourself to something bigger than you. And it's an example of when you come to engage people with different backgrounds. I mean, in my vehicle, when we went outside the wire, we learned to trust each other with our lives. And we're talking about people with totally different political views than mine, racial backgrounds, people of different generations sometimes. Um, and they didn't care. If I was going home to a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they didn't care what country my father immigrated from. Um, they just wanted to know if I knew how to do my job, and that was all I was worried about with them. And, and I, I think a lot about how that thickened my sense of being American. I also believe you shouldn't have to go to war to have that experience. It's one reason I think we'd be well served as a country to have more opportunities for national service. Do you uh, think that should be mandatory? I, I think... I think we could build it out as a social norm. I think mm -hmm. if we ha first of all, we've got to create enough opportunities for mm -hmm. people to do it. But the kind of norm when you're 18 that you go do it so that if you're applying for college, it's the first question in your college interview. And if you're entering the workforce, it's the first thing somebody would ask you about so that it, it becomes something that's universal pretty quick. Okay, so you famously taught yourself Norwegian. <laughs> So you could read the books of an author that weren't yet in translation. Who was this author and what was so compelling about him or her? Yeah, so uh, the author is named Arlind Loa, um, L-O-E, and uh, a friend of mine gave me this book called Naive Super, which is just like the book you need when you're trying to figure out what to do with your life in your early to mid-twenties. Um, it's very simple, it's deceptively simple. It's about this guy trying to figure out who he is. Um, he makes a lot of lists. You kind of have, just have to read it. But um, uh, so I thought, this is really good. It's funny. It's smart. And I also noticed that the language was, was very straightforward and simple for a novel. And then I thought, I want to read this guy's other stuff. But it, it was the only thing I could find in English. Um, and so um, I had been studying Arabic, which is just this beautiful but maddeningly difficult language to study, and found that Norwegian is actually super, for an English speaker, really intuitive. Um, the sentence structure is pretty similar to ours. Um, and so I, I, I picked up a book and, and started working on it and, and was able to, I got about a third of the way through translating one of his other works before life got in the way. And um, uh, still, a, I find a very interesting author. Now, you know, you got, uh, you got Nordic crime fiction, I think is a guilty pleasure for a lot of us. Um, uh, uh, Knausgård wrote this book, uh, My Struggle, that I think has got a lot of attention. So I, I think Norwegian literature's moment has arrived, just as, <laughs> uh, just as my Norwegian has gotten uh, more and more rusty. But um, uh, Do you watch Norwegian slow TV? Uh, there is a great... Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, uh, their most famous one is they have a Yule log oh, yeah, burning, yeah, yeah. but yeah. there are others that just are like snow falling. There's actually like a, asthma, but a, visual. A great TV series, a political military thriller set in the not too distant future called Occupied. Has anybody seen this? It's on Netflix. It's really good, right? <laughs> kind of prophetic. It's about this like kind of backdoor <laughs> Russian manipulation of politics. There's a lot of um, a little bit before its time, um, but. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, I still like to tune into Norwegian stuff every now and then. So I saw this story on Instagram the other day of how an ER doc in South Bend put out a call for an Arabic speaker, and you show up, she has no idea who you are, you just heard the call on the police scanner, which, that's workable, but, um, but are, you, are you gunning for Cory Booker here? You're, you're, <laughs> you know, he's rushing into burning buildings, you're showing up in ER, like... W w so, first of all, my, my, my memory of that's not quite as clear as the doctor's uh, was. I think it was a text, not a, I don't listen to the police scanner all the time, but, um, but, but I, I do get texts when, when something's going on, and, and, and I think I happen to be near the hospital, and, and there was a situation, I think it was, actually must have been a Sudanese family, not Somali, if they needed translation, and I, I tried to go help. So, you know, I, th I believe in making yourself useful whenever you can. And um, 
uh, you know, I think that's the motivation, hopefully that's the motivation for all public servants. Um, and, and, and for whatever choices we make in life, that, that you, you have so many chances to make yourself useful. And uh, whenever that chance arises, you gotta do something. So obviously you're a pretty smart guy. Uh, you know, you've got Rhodes Scholarship, your love for James Joyce, even Finnegan's Wake, the whole teach yourself Norwegian bit. Um, but America seems to be in a mode where it doesn't really celebrate so much either book smarts or common sense, at least with our current president. Um, so. Okay, but the current president's also deeply unpopular. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> So do you think that, that that kind of, which sometimes manifests itself as against elites, but I think even that's come to mean kind of everything and nothing, but this sort of, yeah. this insecurity, this it partly based on inequality, like what's your diagnosis for what the problem is and what the cure could be for that? People well, not wanting to be curious or not, or feeling threatened by people who... For one thing, you know, people have kind of been let down by experts. Uh, I faced this a lot because I, I would often make appeals to expertise when I was making kind of technocratic improvements uh, in South Bend. I mean, simple things like, uh, like we, we reconfigured the way our downtown streets work. Mm -hmm. And part of what we had to do was set up a couple of roundabouts. Uh, roundabouts are not always popular. They reduce, they reduce collisions. There's a lot of good reasons to do it. And so many people would come up to me and, and say, uh, this is a terrible plan, Mayor. It's never going to work. Uh, you know, don't you, like, trucks go on this street. And they could, truck can never get through a roundabout. And I'm thinking to myself, admittedly, I haven't personally verified this, but I'm reasonably certain that the traffic engineers who developed this are familiar with the existence of trucks. <laughs> um, and, and I thought, like, how skeptical have people become of expertise? that they think even basic things, that we can't get our act together. But then you think about the fact that, you know, experts told us that we could make our society and our economy dramatically more productive and that everybody would be better off. And what happened was that we made our society and our economy dramatically more productive and most people stayed right where they were. Since 1973, the tide has risen just about more than any tide has ever risen. And most of the boats stayed right where they were. So you can see why there's a certain amount of disaffection with the kinds of things that Democratic and Republican experts have preached, especially during the era that I think is coming to an end, but the era that you might describe as the, the Reagan consensus mm -hmm. of neoliberal economics has pretty much dominated the way Democratic and Republican presidents have behaved in my entire lifetime. Uh, so I think that has contributed to a sense of, of frustration that in some cases expresses itself with a vote to burn the house down. Which, by the way, is why no investigation is gonna turn up some piece of evidence that's gonna suddenly show us that the president's not a great guy. Because a lot of the people who voted for this president already know he's not a great guy. It's, it's not about that. It's about, uh, it really is a vote to burn the house down. And if we're not paying attention to that, then I think we run the risk of making the same mistake over again. Yes. You've said along those lines that Hillary Clinton spent too much time critiquing Trump, um, but you know she actually did put out a lot of complex policy positions. It's just that nobody, including the media, seemed to care much about it. Yeah. Um, so w anyone who becomes the nominee is going to have to both put forth their own positions and also criticize the president. How right. do you think? the most effective way to criticize him could be, especially to the vaunted Obama to Trump right. voters. Right, I mean, I think the hazard there, and th this is not just a critique of the nominee, we all did this. I think we, we, we started out talking about our nominee, like you do. Then we realized who their nominee was gonna be. And we were so horrified that all we could think about saying was don't vote for this guy. Right. And what got lost in the wash was a lot of people hearing us start out by saying it was all about her, then say it's all about him, say, you're not talking about me. So the more we can convey what we care about in terms of how it's gonna cash out in everyday life, like how your life is gonna be different because you elect us and not them, the better off we'll be. And, and a good example of how this works is the political life of the ACA which went from being politically toxic for Democrats in 2010 to being the winning issue for Democrats in 2018. 
Why? Because it happened. People realized what it meant in their lives, and we could point to that and, and, and mount a very successful campaign around that. So I think the challenge for 2020 is, on one hand, of course we've got to confront this president and this presidency. When he lies, we've got to correct it. When he does something wrong, we've got to confront it. But that's not a message. A message is something that makes sense no matter who you're running against. And it's one of the reasons I talk a lot about my concern for the world as it will look in 2054. That's the year I get, God willing, to the current age of the current president. And I talk about really that rubbing as... rubbing it in there, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's important to remember that this presidency is going to come and go. And if our ideas are good ideas, we've got to have ideas that are going to... A message will make as much sense for 20, 30, 40, or 50. The problem with complex policy proposals, and, and we need them, obviously, and I'm a policy guy, but if we launch right into the PowerPoint and the binders, again, we are both too high and too low altitude. Too, too low in the sense that first we got to win the day for our values, the way I think conservatives largely did, tugging the entire carpet on which all the American political furniture was set rightward so that even Democratic presidents were doing conservative-ish things for a generation. But also, uh, we've got to be nearer to the earth and talking about everything we care about in the most concrete possible terms. You've said that neither centrist versus leftist or capitalism versus socialism is the right frame through which to view liberal politics today. So I hear what you're saying, and yet I don't quite know what you're saying. <laughs> what is the right frame? So it's, look, people want to put you on a dot on a line because it makes it easier to report on politics. It makes it easier to figure out who to attack. Like, I get it. Um, but I think that some of these spectrum analyses have become less and less useful in our current moment. The fact that right populism and left populism started to converge, the, the fact that a lot of people narrowed down their choices to Trump or Bernie, uh, the fact that the president at least pretends to echo a lot of things that Democrats have been saying all along, the fact that criminal justice reform actually unites uh, libertarians, young conservatives, and generations of progressives, all tell you that there is a, a great scrambling going on, some of which might be healthy in our kind of regular battle lines of political ideology. I've also just noticed that voters aren't as ideological as we think. Appealing to independence has never been more important. It has also never been less related to ideological centrism. So the 90s formula was, we gotta get through to the independence, we're on the left, uh, they're somewhere between us and the right, so let's just go halfway there and they'll like us. And that worked as far as it went in the 90s. I don't think that works anymore. I don't think that independents are actually people who are strongly committed to being ideologically in the middle. I think they're people who have ideological threads from all over the place and really just want to know somebody who's be, going to be for them and don't have this kind of tribal loyalties that the rest of us have developed to our respective parties and movements. You know, I'm sure like a lot of people that um, you first came to my attention when you ran to head the DNC and, um, you know, you were quite well spoken as you are here tonight, but also you made some really compelling statements about getting past the Bernie Clinton divide. Mm -hmm. um, this time around, how can Democratic candidates ensure that they don't cripple each other and clear the path for a Trump re-election? Right. What you want to do is you want to nominate a really a kind of forward-thinking, inclusive, new generation, young, good-looking mayor. <laughs> look, look, I mean, one, one benefit... <laughs> sorry, I, I, I couldn't help it. Um, one benefit of the current presidency is, if nothing else, I think anybody left of that or just anybody who doesn't like what that's doing to our country recognizes there's a kind of uh, there's a kind of wolf at the gates, and uh, that can be unifying, and it had better be, because we don't have the luxury of sniping at each other over the 20% of the platform that within our side we're not too sure we agree on, uh, knowing that the the future of our republic, the character of our democracy, and and the nature of American leadership in the world is at stake. I think everybody gets that, but um, you know, now with the 10 or 20 of us, uh, everybody's on their best behavior. It is going to be really important as this resolves into lanes and eventually hardens into a zero sum competition that we remember why we're doing this and that our values, at least generally speaking, are pretty well aligned. 
Um, one feminist writer tweeted about you that, um, I'll just read the tweet. I really like Pete Buttigieg. He is intelligent, he is decent, he is curious, but when he says, I think the policy matters, I'm a policy guy, but all of his policies are basically Warren's, except less specific and less progressive, <laughs> I wonder <laughs> why he's not working for her. Now, let me hasten to say that if that was said about a rising female star, there'd be really a ferocious outrage. Um, but that said, if you were Mayor Pam, same exact background, would people take you as seriously? I don't know. I hope so. Uh, if there were a mayor uh, with a similar record and a similar set of stances and a similar approach and a similar message, ideally from the industrial Midwest, who are seeking to do this, uh, I would probably be following her. Um, I think that sexism is still alive and well, and it affects our politics, and just because we're on the left side of the aisle doesn't mean that it isn't impacting politics on the Democratic side, too. So if the objection is that uh, it may be easier for a male candidate today, I don't disagree. Um, but I am who, if, if the objection is I shouldn't run because I'm a guy, <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. I think it's more, and you know, not just about you, that that a women are looking forward to to a female president, but yeah. also that um, you know that now you've caught fire, Beto's caught fire, in addition to Bernie and and Biden, that that there are these great female candidates, and are they even being given a chance? And I'm just curious what you think about that. Yeah, I think everybody gets a chance right now. I, I think Democrats really do want to explore what each of our messengers have to say and those messages. And look, I, I, I don't think that my positions are quite the same as any of the others, but 80% of the message is going to converge. And that's a good thing. That's a sign of some cohesion uh, on our side of the aisle. I've put things out into the, into the world that I've noticed other candidates a couple weeks later saying, almost verbatim. And I'm not going to claim pride of authorship because it's not like I invented any of these ideas myself either. I think we're all seeking to popularize certain sets of ideas. Um, and uh, and that's, it's fine for us to compete over who's going to be best positioned to uh, further popularize and then actually implement them. So in this vein of thinking, there's, you know, there's really no way that someone can clinch the Democratic nomination without winning over women, and particularly African-American women. Yeah. How do you aim to do that? So part of it is quantity time, especially in African-American communities. Uh, we were just in South Carolina, which among the early states is, I think, where uh, a lot of candidates or would-be candidates go to open that dialogue. Um, but it's also been part of, of my practice from day one in South Bend. I pride myself uh, on having won the, the heavily African-American. I should probably pause here, because you might picture one thing when you think of South Bend, if all you know about us is our football games and, and stuff. You might picture tidy, <laughs> ethnically homogenous, wealthy college town. So you should know that uh, we're an industry town um, that is 45% non-white and largely low income. So I just want to make sure folks understand that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the concerns, I think we have to do two things at once. On one hand, we have to I, I name and respect the specific concerns of different communities in our coalition. Uh, so uh, women of color have different and harder outcomes when it comes to things like uh, maternal and infant mortality, uh, when it comes to things like pay equity, and we can go on down the list. And we need to, to name those and uh, explain what we're going to do to make it better. And at the same time, I think we need to be speaking in terms of values that will unify everybody, that will make sense to everybody. Um, because I fear sometimes that our politics, especially among Democrats, has been about inventing a different language and a different message for each little slice of our constituency groups, and then hoping when we staple them all together, it's 50% plus one. And I just don't think that rouses the same kind of purpose and, and glues the coalition together the way that, that if we get the right vocabulary around why freedom is a progressive value, why democracy needs to be worked on, why 21st century security is different, um, why a sense of belonging should unify the aspirations of a displaced uh, blue collar worker in Indiana just as, as much as a transgender kid who just has to go to the bathroom like everyone else or a, or a woman of color trying to make it in the workplace or an undocumented person, that we should 
have this as a source of solidarity, mm -hmm. not as a, a way to isolate ourselves into different groups with different agendas. So as you just pointed out, uh, Midwestern industrial cities are not the same as Midwestern farm country, uh, mm -hmm. demographically or otherwise. For, but for those Midwestern industrial cities, what, what are the issues that are most motivating to those voters? What do you see as their top concern? I think, like everybody else, people want to know that they're going to be okay. There's a need for security. Um, and, you know, it's not just that a lot of jobs are changing. It's that when your job changes, your identity gets thrown into disarray. And I think we've experienced that very acutely in the industrial Midwest. And I think when that happens, that can also leave people vulnerable to radicalization. I'm not saying that we can excuse racism in the name of economic anxiety. I'm saying that some of the anxieties that have arisen make people ripe to be targeted mm -hmm. by uh, efforts to radicalize them. The same as what happens in the Middle East. And uh, in my part of the country, people are wondering whether they fit, whether they belong, and what they're supposed to do. Especially when they do all the retraining things that well-intentioned center-left programs, like some of the ones I'm running in South Bend, tell them to do. They do all the right things, and they still see their standard of living declining. And they, even if we figure out a way to keep the income level, which when we're working really hard at this, we can do, by telling a, a, a machinist 16 years into his career that from now on uh, he's got to be a nurse's aide. And it's a perfectly good career, but it's not how he understands how he fits into the world. Speaking to that, that lost sense of identity mm -hmm. is extremely important. And it's only going to become more urgent as automation changes the way we relate to, uh, to the world. Um, in particular, changes the way we relate to the workforce. You just can't count on a lifelong relationship with a single employer to define where you fit into the world the way you used to. It's for some of us, but not for most of us. And if we're not speaking to that, then I think we're gonna continue to see this kind of uh, uh, disaffection that has made people so ripe for the, pro the false promise being peddled by this White House that the solution is just to turn back the clock, that we can just stop these changes that are so disruptive for you and we're gonna, we're gonna make America great again. You know, what does that mean? It means we're gonna stop the changes so you don't have to change anything. And it's not honest. You can't have an honest politics that revolves around the word again. You know, Your letter to the Muslim community of South Bend following the New Zealand mosque massacres um, got a lot of attention. And I think it's worth noting for those who don't know that, you know, Indiana historically has been a pretty big hotbed of white supremacy, yeah. huge Klan presence. Yeah. Um, even with people not going, how do you, how do you, what are the methods you think are effective to fight that kind of ultimate radicalization, but also just the sort of white grievance culture that's going on yeah. now? Well, first it has to be confronted and called out as wrong. So as much as I'm talking about, you know, dealing with some of these root conditions that make people vulnerable, you also just, anytime you see it, this is not a question of fine people on both sides. This is a question of right and wrong. And you have to name it as such. Um, Again, if we don't, now that being said, if we don't have good, good options to fill the sense of community identity and purpose that's being lost, then some very ugly things will be offered, right? So you can fill that. You, community and identity and purpose don't have to come from your workplace. They can come from your role in your family. They can come from your faith. One thing as a mayor I'm particularly excited about is they can come from the role you play in your community. But if we don't do that, then they just might come from... Uh, substance abuse or, uh, or white nationalism or something else that's really harmful. Um, so in between those two is, is where moral leadership matters. So the, the letter to the Muslim community happened. Um, I, I was um, 
I got a phone call. I woke up, as we all did, to this horrifying news out of New Zealand. And I got a phone call from a prominent member of the Islamic community in South Bend. And on the surface, he was asking about something very tactical. He was asking about security arrangements and did the police uh, chief know how to connect with the FBI folks they talked to for security because they were going to Friday prayers that evening. But you could tell what was really at stake. I mean, we did all that. But what was really at stake was this sense of hurt and this question about whether they belonged. And so I realized as important or more important than my phone call to the police chief was uh, offering some words for the imam to read to the congregation that night, saying that this community supports you, that you belong here, to have your mayor tell you um, that this community is better off because you're here. And we're not, we're not tolerating you. <laughs> we're, not, we're not viewing you as just exercising your rights. We're glad you're here. You are making our community better off, and we're going to protect you as we would any other neighbors. And... Um, <laughs> And, and it's just the latest installment in a kind of long re-education I've gone through on what public office is about. Because, of course, as a consultant, I came in wanting to parse the 311 data and, and <laughs> do the, the, the metrically countable government things. But there's really three parts to executive jobs in government. It's that, capably running an organization. It's implementing good policies. That's the part that overlaps with what legislators do most. And... Um, and then it's this other intangible thing of calling people their highest values that I think we see missing so, so horribly in the White House. And that's as important a part of the job as the policy decision making. And it took me a while to accept that as a mayor who was into you know, tactical things that I could study and measure and count. But uh, what I've learned over the going on eight years in that job is that sometimes that's actually when you earn your paycheck. That's when it matters that it's you and not somebody else in that job. You've said you're open to court packing. Mm. Uh, maybe. Let's, let's court packing curious. Expand this. <laughs> <laughs> let's expand this a little bit. So, I believe we need Supreme Court reform. Um, my idea is not that the thing we need to do is throw some more justices on there to pull the court to the left because it's too conservative, even though it is too conservative. Um, because if you do that, somebody else will do the same thing. My point is we need to do something to make the Supreme Court less political. So I'm trying to open the debate on structural reform. There's different versions of it. The one I find most attractive is, and there will be an article on this soon, I think, in the Yale Law Journal, is a, a structure where you have 15 justices. Ten of them are selected by the traditional political process. The other five can only be seated by a unanimous agreement of the remaining ten. And so it'll get you more of your Kennedys, your suitors, your justices who think for themselves. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to rotate people off the appellate bench. People are talking about term limits, but I'm not sure that's enough to fix this problem. Um, maybe there's something I haven't thought of. But the point is we've got to open this discussion. And for those who think it's a little radical, I would say, first of all, there's, there's some people think you can do this without touching the Constitution, that it can be done statutorily. Um, but also, this is no more a shattering of norms than what's already been done by the Republican Senate. In fact, you know, they, they changed the number of Supreme Court justices to eight. Yeah. And then changed it back once they took over. Yes. Uh, we don't have that much time left, so I'm going to just hit you with a few quick ones. Are you Medicare for all or Medicare for anyone? I don't know what you mean by Medicare for anyone. I believe in Medicare for all. I think the way to get there is to make a version of Medicare available on the exchanges. Uh, and if people like me are right that that's going to be a more cost-effective way as well as an easier way to get covered, then that will be the glide path. Look, I believe in Medicare for all. I just think anyone who, any politician who lets those words escape his or her lips ought to have some account of how you get there. And that, I don't know if that's what you mean by Medicare for anyone, but that's my idea of how you get there. You could opt there. into it if you want. Yeah, and then Medicare slowly... for all who want it uh, yeah. as the pathway to Medicare for all. Okay. Uh, most, you know, most presidents get to do one or two really big things in, in every four-year term. So what's your day one top priority, given the world as you know it today? It's democratic reform. 
It's, it's the condition of our democracy because every other issue we face, every policy issue, of which I believe the most urgent is climate, every one of those will not get solved properly as long as our democracy is this twisted. And so a package of, of reforms resembling H.R. 1 that was passed in the House but will die in the Senate, probably, um, uh, which, among other things, uh, contains the role of dark money and makes it easier to vote and to register to vote, should be coupled with other moves like serious action on money and politics, redistricting, um, perhaps the Electoral College, which I think needs to go. Um, and <laughs> not, because, not because I think you can do this in a day or, or even in one term, but because we've got to initiate those reforms before our democracy gets so twisted that we can't fix anything. So we have in, we'd like you guys to start lining up to uh, present Pete with your own questions. Um, there'll be mics kind of passed around. Um, so let me just ask one quick question while they're getting out there. Um, and that is that I've noticed that the, the female candidates um, have made a point of nodding to a policy proposal by one of the other female candidates in particular that they like. Hmm. So I'm just wondering what is a policy proposal that someone else has put forward that you particularly admire? Oh, there's tons of good ideas out there. I mean, I love the, uh, you know, I think the wealth tax idea makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't see how we get our revenue problems fixed without doing that. Um, I think that uh, worker representation on corporate boards is very attractive. I think that uh, the baby bonds concept or some kind of way to deal with liquid asset poverty is really important. I mean, everybody's brought forward good ideas. Uh, and I don't pretend to have invented any of the policy ideas I propose. I think my job is to vindicate them and help them gain purchase in the political space. Okay, so guys, now we're going to do uh, audience Q&A. Um, I will just say, as always, this is for questions, not <laughs> statements, not speeches. Um, so please keep it short and with a question mark at the end so we can get to as many as possible. Folks with mics are going to be coming around. We have one right here. We've got a question in the back for you. Hi. I got a quick uh, foreign policy question. Senator Bernie Sanders is, seemed to be the only politician whose perspective of the Arab-Israeli conflict is outside the mainstream political consensus. Are you an insider or an outsider? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of your question. Say again. I'm asking if you have a different perspective ah. as compared to uh, other politicians, yeah. and uh, in comparison to Senator Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I, I may not be fully conversant in his particular perspective, but I'll, I'll share mine. Um, yeah, I, I was in Israel not long ago, and uh, you come away with uh, as many questions as answers. Uh, on one hand, you see, you witness the achievements of that society. And on the other hand, I met nobody who could explain to me, in the absence of a two-state solution, uh, how they can be a Jewish state and a democratic state for much longer. Um, these issues are being robustly debated, uh, among other things, by Israelis, increasingly being robustly debated among uh, the American Jewish community. And we need to be able to have a robust debate which recognizes that support for the U.S.-Israel alliance does not have to entail support for the Israeli right wing. And being skeptical of the Israeli right does not make you anti-Israel, much less anti-Semitic. I, I will also say that as we have that debate, we have a moral obligation to make sure that we're doing it in a way that never intentionally or unintentionally, echoes some of the ugliest stereotypes that have been hurled against Jews in America and elsewhere around the world. And that's really important too. Um, as I'm very intrigued as you're a data-driven mayor, I, I've never met or heard of a politician that has used data to make uh, decisions. <laughs> so I'm very intrigued. now. I'm asking you a question two part. One, um, we have a very large um, homeless population that is substance addicted here. Yeah. And we have a very large budget to address 7,000 homeless 
uh, most have substance abuse issues. And every year we give more money to this issue and we end up never ever seeming to solve it. Right. Do you have any ideas how you might come and help us with, I'm serious, yeah. because we need data driven methods because we have 72 nonprofits. Right. And nobody is accountable. And I'd like to know how you can help us. <laughs> well, I can't claim to have solved either the problem of addiction or the problem of homelessness. But I, but I will say we face it too in our community at a different scale, but at, a, at an alarming scale all the same. And uh, the good news is I think we have become a little more enlightened in understanding the extent to which addiction is a medical issue uh, instead of treating it simply as a moral issue. Um, and, and as you know, when it comes to the homeless community, there's also uh, a, a pretty jarring overlap with, with substance issues and then with mental health diagnoses. Um, we clearly have a system that, first of all, is just under-resourced when it comes to mental health capacity. Uh, we're also still coming around as a society in terms of recognizing how we can treat addiction. What we do know is that some things work. Uh, we know that permanent supportive housing works. We know that establishing by name lists of the chronically homeless uh, enables you to route people into permanent supportive housing, that housing first. Uh, we used to think that you gotta get clean before we can uh, put you in shelter and, or you'll never make it. Now I think we're viewing it the other way, at least we are in South Bend, and I think most of the good thinking on this issue is in this direction, that let's at least get you indoors and then we'll figure out how to begin dealing with the other stuff. Um, and I, I also think that uh, what we learned from the near conquering of veterans homeless is that when we take a piece of the puzzle, we can learn a lot. So there's a dramatic reduction in veterans' homelessness in many U.S. cities. And I think we can use that to vault to the next target, uh, which is uh, homelessness for families with children. Uh, I believe that we can actually, with the last estimate I heard was $11 billion, just routed toward existing m machinery we already know how to set up, like permanent supportive housing, could address nationally. Uh, chronic homelessness for, uh, uh, for anyone with children. That's a remarkably, it's a big number, but it's also not in the grand scheme of things. Um, and we might be able to learn from that how to get to the next and toughest uh, set of homeless people that we're trying to take care of, which is those who are chronically homeless with uh, substance abuse and or mental health diagnoses. We have one in the back. Okay. Who, com who comprises your foreign policy brain trust so I have benefited from being able to turn to a lot of people right now on a volunteer basis, but people who have had, uh, ranging from people who had a lot of responsibility, especially in the Obama administration, uh, to people that uh, have worked in different areas of foreign policy, to people who are kind of on the outside in. Uh, and we'll be rolling out in a more formal way uh, in the future, kind of a roster of some of the people who have agreed to advise us. Um, I'm learning that the politics of naming your advisors is a whole seen. Um, and so I want to make sure I don't complicate somebody else's career by rattling off the names before we publish a list. But uh, what I will say is that I'm looking for, I, I care about experience and I want to talk to people who have confronted these issues from positions of responsibility uh, in, in the U.S. government. But uh, I do believe that the, the concern about what's sometimes been called the blob, uh, the foreign policy establishment and the group think that can come out of that, I think that concern is, is justified, especially at a time when neither party candidly has figured out its foreign policy since the Cold War. Um, you know, right now the U.S. doesn't have a foreign policy at all. Uh, and uh, frankly, Democrats still haven't quite figured out uh, what our doctrine is. I think the frame, the, the rudimentary elements of it are um, that all of our decisions around, uh, around, especially anything like military intervention, but any big decision uh, is rooted in core life and death American interests, but that we vet what we think we're doing in American interests against American values, because every time we've thought that we could do something for American interests that was against American values, we were wrong. And then we, we recognize that at any time we responsibly can, any action we take uh, to defend our interests in accordance with our values is done in consultation and cooperation with American allies. Uh, you add to that the, the famous uh, uh, foreign policy proviso, I would call it the Obama proviso, uh, which is don't do stupid shit. Um, <laughs> and you have the basic left and right boundaries of a foreign policy approach for the future.
Um, how do you think that the Democratic Party can embody the ideals of the Big Ten while at the same time unifying behind progressive platforms? And when you say the Big Ten, you're talking about kind of regionally, the, yeah. the Midwest, or yeah? No, the whole country. The, oh, the idea of the Democratic Party. Oh, sorry, Big Party Tent. I was thinking about the Big, Big Ten. Tent. I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> so, sorry. My fault, not yours. Um, so, part of what I'm trying to build is the idea that a lot of these so called left positions are actually centrist positions by the standards of the American people, just not by the standards of the American Congress. Um, so, the idea that we need a higher federal minimum wage, the idea that we should have more progressive labor standards on everything from overtime to paid family leave, uh, uh, and, and things outside of the economics for background checks. You know, the thing that's supposed to be really divisive, only 80 or 90 percent of Americans agree on it. So the real shocker is how is it that most Americans can agree on that and Congress can't get it done? Immigration, that's been used as the most divisive issue of our moment, is actually the object of a consensus among the American people. Most people are for a comprehensive immigration reform along the lines of what uh, the Senate passed at one point and died in the House. Uh, you, you, you have a compromise where you have uh, improvements in border security coupled with status for dreamers and a pathway to citizenship for the undocumented and improvements to our lawful immigration uh, system. I mean, we, we know what to do. And somehow, with the leadership we have now, has, in, in, instead of doing what leadership is supposed to do, take a divided uh, America and bring it to consensus, it's actually managed to take a consensus issue and divide America around it. It's, it's actually almost magical. <laughs> and, um, and so, look, I'm not saying that, that every American or even the majority will agree with every progress, progressive position I believe in. But I guess the other point I'll mention is, you know, having to serve in an, in an area that's very ideologically diverse. Um, part of how I've been able to earn sometimes independent or Republican support is not so much by pretending to be more conservative than I am, but rather by stressing the values that motivate my commitments. And what I find is that even somebody with different values will give you a certain amount of credit just knowing that, that values are what got you where you are and that your positions are something you came by honestly. We're all the way in the back. Um, hi. I was a little confused by your Medicare for all slash anyone answer, so I just was hoping for a clarification. Sure. Do you believe in universal equal access to health care for all Americans regarding as, re regardless of employment or economic status? And if so, can you explain your thoughts on that? Um, I'm asking because I don't think the exchange is working for everyone and I don't necessarily see that as a path to success for us. Yeah. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, so the answer to your question is yes. And the reason I talk about a, a Medicare for all who want it pathway is I don't believe this is something that can just be converted overnight. I believe that two things need to happen to improve healthcare efficiency and cost in the country. One set of things is kind of technocratic under the hood. You think about things like, uh, if you ever had the phrase prior authorization thrown at you while you're trying to get something done medically, right? You, you, things like that should not be touched by multiple human hands. They should be automatically dealt with. And even within Medicare, we got a lot of inefficiencies there that need to be dealt with. So that's, that's one set of things that's probably not as ideologically freighted, but we really need to do, even, even in a single payer environment. It won't be enough if we don't fix that. But secondly, I believe we need to make it a matter of principle that everybody should be able to be covered. Uh, and you're right, the exchanges are complicated and they can be frustrating and they have not taken care of everybody. I think we're dramatically better off than we were before. A lot of people I care about um, have life-saving health care because of the ACA, um, but it's not enough. That's one of the reasons why I believe a very inclusive and generous Medicare-style public option that everyone can buy into is the start. I believe more and more people will buy into it. I suppose we're daring the corporate world to come up with something better, but I don't have high expectations. <laughs> so I think what will happen if we get it right is that that will become the preferred plan and eventually the single payer in our payer environment. And there will always be, even in places with outright socialized medicine, there's still a private market that's kind of a superstructure on top of that, and that's fine. Um, but for our core needs, for our primary health care, we can't keep relying on the tender mercies of the corporate patchwork system that we have today. We have time 
her two more questions. Good. I was hoping they'd call on you. You've had your hand up so long. <laughs> cool. Abortion is such a polarizing issue in the country, and abortion rights are actually getting worse in a lot of states. So I'm wondering, how do you think about this issue, and how do you plan to address it during the campaign? Yeah, so as you can imagine, a Democrat from Indiana living uh, in the backyard of Notre Dame, this is pretty sensitive for us, too. And a lot of people I care about, a lot of my friends, uh, a lot of my supporters view this issue differently than I do. But the way I view it is pretty simple. When I talk about freedom, I believe that includes reproductive freedom. And when it is literally impossible for me to really understand some of the choices that confront women who, who are making that decision, whether it's in the vast majority of cases, which is early in a pregnancy, or in uh, the tiny, uh, proportionally tiny number of generally medically horrible situations uh, that lead to something later in a term. What I do know is that uh, as a woman is wrestling with uh, her uh, balancing her health and her values and making that choice, um, I think a doctor can help. I do not think the intervention of a male politician or government official or boss can help at all. We've got just one last question for you. Great. Hi, uh, one more foreign policy question, particularly with the last couple of weeks. What is your thoughts of Brexit and then the U.S. relation, um, of U.K.'s relations with Europe and U.K. with uh, the U.S.? So, the you could argue that <clears throat> what's happening in Europe prefigures what's happening in the U.S. Often, like they're just kind of a beat ahead. I mean, I first noticed it in terms of style, like a font that catches on in England will be, <laughs> will be cool here like 18 months later. Um, unfortunately, no nothing populism seemed to follow the same pathway. Um, and, and there's something to the idea that, that uh, you know, Brexit was a harbinger of what was about to hit us here in the US. Doesn't seem to, I mean, it's not really my place to tell the UK what to do, but it doesn't seem like it's making them any better off. Uh, I hope that they will find their way toward being able to reevaluate that and maybe put it to the people again because I think there shouldn't be, you shouldn't let pride get in the way of reconsideration. If, if I did that, I wouldn't be a very good mayor. And I think the British people may have a chance to, may, may, now that they're staring down the barrel of it, uh, may realize that, that this is not what they thought it would be. Either way, the U.S.-U.K. relationship is going to be extremely important on everything from uh, trade and culture to security cooperation, and I don't think that changes. Um, but uh, everything from uh, you know, complicating their border with Northern Ireland to uh, wrecking their role as a kind of gateway in the financial sector to Europe is, is going, in my view, um, to make things harder for them, and I hope that they can find some way uh, to reintegrate or to uh, to reevaluate that decision. Now, I will say, if if Europe, even though there's some things going on in Europe that we don't um, want to happen in the U.S., especially in kind of rightist populism and certain forms of nationalism, they are demonstrating a very interesting track record of electing uh, heads of state in their 30s, and <laughs> <laughs> that part I'm on board with. Well, I'm, I'm sure like all of you, I would love to sit here and grill Pete for another couple of hours on all manner of topics, um, but we have to wrap up. So it is an informed tradition to ask all our speakers the following question, which is, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? No pressure. So <laughs> as a mayor, I really want to tell you about how we came to have the smartest sewers in the world. Um, but. Uh, but you can read about that in, in the book. Um, at risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm going to talk about uh, the thing that I think would really change the world, which is for America, which preaches freedom and democracy, which identifies ourselves as the champion of freedom and democracy around the world, uh, which has a model that to this day, as we face stiffer and stiffer competition from models ranging from the Chinese approach to the Russian approach, uh, is still the one I believe in most that the thing that'll change the world, as it has before, is for America to actually live up 
to its own ideals of freedom and democracy and behave accordingly both at home and abroad.